It's if you are in math, uh, Mark, sorry. If you're in Mark, we're in chapter 1, and hopefully you can hold your finger there and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So this is how we're going to start today. And by the way, the way we are starting today and the way we always start is very contra to what we are told we should be doing as far as being effective church ministry. And in things like Rick Warren's Purpose Driven Ministry, he says you should never start off with the scripture. You should start off with felt needs of the people. And I categorically disagree with that. And just because of that, we're starting off with the scripture. <laughs> but we always start off with the scripture. So, so here's where we're at. So we just started the book of Mark. And as we start the book of Mark, we just finish the book of Matthew, which finished with the Great Commission. And as we took time to look at the Great Commission, what we saw is really that is what a Christian is supposed to do. We are to be Great Commission people. That means that we are to go and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey the commandments of the Lord. And that's, that's, what it, that's what we do as Christians. And whenever you start to mess with that, you start to mess with the very purpose in which we are here as believers. So I, I first want to start off and just ask you and, and ask you to really think about how the Great Commission factors into your life if you are a Christian. In other words, what value do you place and where do you exercise your life and your energy when the Bible says that as believers, the reason that we're here on earth is to make disciples. So Paul touches on this in a particular way. I really like this in 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, so right there, are, are you in Christ? You don't have to raise your hand, but that's what it means to be born again, to be a believer. You're, you're in Christ. And then he says, if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. He says, now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So what that means is if you've truly been changed and transformed by God, then you have the ministry of reconciliation it doesn't mean there are, there are certain people that are called to this ministry. It means that if you're a new creation, subsequent to being a new creation is that you have the ministry of reconciliation. And then he explains it. He says that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. So turn back with me. So because this is, is now how God reaches people with the, the message of re reconciliation because this is now the time where the work of Jesus Christ is now expressed and manifest 
through individual believers, Satan attacks this particular area. And we see this going on in our society, in our culture, in Christianity in America. We see the Great Commission attacked. And when that's attacked, then Christianity becomes something that it was never intended to be. And so this is what we do. If you're a believer, this is what you do. This is why you're here. This is why I am here. In John 15, 16, it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your, your fruit should remain. So we're stepping in. As we step into Christ, we're stepping in to a whole new purpose of why we exist on the planet. And it's the Great Commission. So then the second thing is, well, how do we do that? Well, how does that look? And the, to me, the really neat, exciting thing is that it looks different in everyone's life. So God has uniquely gifted us and positioned us in a way where when we simply exercise the things of God in our life, we become witnesses to Him. But we first have to understand that as believers, this is our thing, the Great Commission. And then, how does that look? So we have to be asking ourselves, well, how does that look for me? How does that work itself out? And we're going to look at that this morning. And why this is so important is because not only is the Great Commission attacked, because it's the very purpose in which God has left Christians on the earth for, but then the next thing is Satan will attack how to do that. So in, in the ways that he does that is, is often just we compromise the message. We think that it's about changing the world through politics or through worldly means, and we can get mixed up in that in inappropriate ways. But I want to look this morning exactly Jesus' ministry as an example of effective ministry. And that's what we're going to do this morning. So if you're in Mark, notice in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, it starts off, and we mentioned last week that this is most likely the gospel of Peter as given to Mark to write it down. And he starts off, he says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So, as he introduces what he's about to say, he's, he's introducing that when Jesus came, it was the beginning of the gospel or the good news. So this book should be a book of good news. Jesus was the person who came and brought the good news. He was the good news, and that's why it's the, the gospel. And so, as we understand that, as ministers or, uh, of reconciliation, as ambassadors of heaven, that means that, that God has given us a message that is good news. It, it means that we have the answer that the world needs. And not only one answer of many answers, it means that we genuinely have the answer, the only answer, as Jesus said, I am the what? Way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. And so when, when we start to deviate, when we think the gospel is not enough, when we think it's the gospel plus or the gospel and, then what we're doing is we're starting to get away from the answer, the truth. And we get, we'll get all tangled up in all of these ideologies. Read Colossians 2.8. We're not to be 
deceived and taken away by empty philosophies and, and the things of the world that carry us away. And so we looked at the forerunner, John the Baptist, last week and how Mark was saying that, that Jesus would come after the forerunner. So we looked at that last week. But, but now look at what happens. We begin the ministry of Jesus. And notice, notice uh, Mark is just, this happened, this happened, this happened. It's almost like, like he's just a crime scene reporter or something, just writing down, this happened, this happened. So we, you, you get a different flavor than Matthew, per se, where he was explaining a lot more in, in Mark's gospel, he's just talking about the facts. So verse 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. So now this is very interesting. Because the... The way that Mark presents, he, he skips over a lot of stuff. And good thing we have the other Gospels fill in a lot of the details. But Mark isn't interested in a lot of those details because he's focusing on Jesus as the servant king and what he did. But he introduces Jesus. This is how he introduces Jesus. So... No genealogy, no wise men, no angels, no um, manger, none of that. He just, he just says, Jesus, here Jesus came and he was baptized. Now, why did Mark start off like that? And what can we glean from this? Well, John's, if you remember, John was baptizing people and he was baptizing people in a unique and really an un unusual way because at that time there's really no such thing as baptism. The Jews would have ceremonial cleansings but not baptism. And then if somebody wanted to convert as a Gentile to Judaism, then they would have to be going through a ceremonial cleansing which would be a water immersion but John comes on the on the scene and he's immersing people in water and dunking them and he's telling them that you need to do this because the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand and he's referring to to Jesus being here a sort of a, a new era where now Jesus is, is coming to fulfill the Old Testament law that they were unable to fulfill, that people in general were unable to fulfill. And, and so he started baptizing them. But what he was saying is, you need to be baptized because you need to repent from your sins. And being baptized was a way to show that you were serious about that. And it was more in lines of you're showing people that you, you're willing to turn from your sin and then you would be cleansed as you'd be sort of dunked. You'd be cleansed as in the Jewish tradition. So why would Jesus need to be baptized? Because Jesus is sinless. Jesus doesn't need to repent of his sins. Matthew gives us a little more insight and John, you remember, John the Baptist was fighting with Jesus about this and saying, I can't baptize you, uh, a profession of that John knew who he was. He said, I can't baptize you. And Jesus said, I need to do this. And in Matthew 3.15, Jesus said, Permit it to be so, for it is filling for us, fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So in other words, Jesus is saying, as a human, I need to be baptized, even though I am sinless, but I need to do it to fulfill 
the commandment of God, which God gave to John the Baptist as a human, and I need to be obedient to God, the Father. And so what this is showing us, first and foremost, as Jesus is being baptized, he's showing us in his human part, his human nature, that it was important for him to show us the necessity of obedience. And as he was demonstrating and showing the necessity of obedience, what then they would begin to understand and this idea would develop is now that baptism was actually a picture, not just ceremonial cleansing of, of things coming off of you, but now the development of this picture that when you're immersed in water, you're telling people publicly, I renounce myself. I renounce who I am without God. I am, in essence, being buried. I'm being buried as we go down. I'm, I'm dying to myself in, in sort of like this water coffin, symbolically expressing what is necessary for a believer or for somebody to come to Christ, I should say, is that is to die to themselves. So Jesus then is giving us this picture of obedience. This is really the first point of Jesus' example of effective ministry is obedience. And Jesus, the eternal, coexistent, second member of the Godhead, came into this world took on human flesh, never renounced his deity, so he was 100% God, 100% man, and in the book of Mark, it's identifying him and showing him in his humanity and how he's identifying with us as sinners as a prelude to what is given to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where it pleased God the Father to send Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. So here Jesus is in obedience to the will of God the Father, and he's identifying with us as sinful human beings so that he would be able to pay the price for our sin. And when he's doing that, then he's showing us if there's going to be effective ministry or fruit coming from our life, it just simply starts with obedience. And Jesus was showing how radical that obedience was. That, that he was willing to show to the people that he was going to do what was asked of him. And that's what Matthew said, so that it was fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. So then what happens? Look at verse 10. And immediately, which we talked about last week, this word immediately is uh, something that's characteristic of this book. It's listed 35 to 40 times in this book because it's just scene after scene after scene. And it says, And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting. And that word parting means to, to tear open. So you picture this scene of, of Jesus, and remember, Jesus came with masses of people that were coming to John to baptize him, and he's coming, and there's all these people around, and Jesus is saying, baptize me, and John the Baptist is saying, I can't do that, I don't baptize you, and he says, it's necessary, it's fitting to fulfill all righteousness, and then he says, okay, and then he puts them down, and then he brings them up, and the heavens tear apart. The atmosphere, the sky, and there are witnesses seeing this. The most important witness is John the Baptist. Why is it important for John the Baptist to see this? Because this was something that signified to John the Baptist, confirmed to John the Baptist, that this was in fact 
who he thought it was. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the heavens open up. And I love that scene. Just a couple days ago, I was driving down 1171. And you know how the weather's been lately? Just really neat clouds and things. And it was all cloudy. And there's just like this hole in the clouds. And the sun was shining through that. And it just, I just thought about this. I thought, man, that that's gives me a little like glimpse of maybe what this was like a little bit. Just this, this intersection of heaven and earth is what we're seeing here. So what happens is as the heavens tear apart, it says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, descended upon Jesus like a dove. And in Luke 3.22, it says the, actually says the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. So now what we're seeing here is something amazing. We're, we're getting a good understanding of the Trinity. So we see the, the Son, Jesus. We see now the Holy Spirit. And what was seen was, according to Luke, that the Holy Spirit was coming in a very tangible way where people were able to see. And when it says he came like a dove, it doesn't mean the Holy Spirit looked like a dove. Luke tells us the Holy Spirit came in bodily form, which is interesting. I don't really care to elaborate on that too much because it just that's what it says. And I don't, you know, that he came in bodily form, but it came in the manner of a dove. So sort of gently resting on Jesus, coming down on Jesus. And it says, descending upon him like a dove. And so here's, here's what we see from this. As Jesus came as human being, it was necessary for the Holy Spirit then to come and, uh, and fill him because Jesus' ministry was the work of the Holy Spirit working through an obedient, submitted person to God the Father. So what does that tell us? It tells us of the necessity of the Holy Spirit. For us, if that was necessary for Jesus, how necessary is the Holy Spirit for us to accomplish the things that God has called us to accomplish. And then in verse 11, it says, Then a voice came from heaven and says, You, or the voice said, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so that was the testimony of God the Father. So we see God the Father testifying to God the Son and the Holy Spirit coming upon the Son to equip him, enable him as he took on humanity to fulfill the purposes of God. Does that make sense? So point number one, Jesus' example of effective ministry is obedience that leads to power. So a lot of times we have these ideas of the Holy Spirit. Some of you are very afraid of the Holy Spirit, possibly, because you've seen things on TV or maybe been to a church that makes you feel uncomfortable, like there are things really weird going on. And I want to encourage you to understand there's extremes in every direction. We want to be balanced. But we have to know if anything of God is going to come through our life, it's going to be because of the Holy Spirit working through our obedience. So, if we're not obedient, the Holy Spirit's not going to empower our disobedience. The Holy Spirit is empowering us. It's like the Holy Spirit works on this track of obedience. And so, as we walk with God, we will also be empowered by God to do His will. And we saw a big part of doing His will is being ambassadors for Christ. So one of the really amazing things about walking in obedience to the Lord is you begin to watch God do things through your life that 
you're amazed yourself about. That it's something where you, you say, God, I can't believe that you're doing those things through my life. And there's where you get the supernatural touching the natural. And it's, instead of being this huge mystical thing, it's walking in obedience to the Lord. And then there, there's this empowering of a person's life to bear fruit for his kingdom. So that's point number one. What about point number two? Look at verse 12. Immediately, there it is again, the Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Now that is a statement that for a lot of us is very surprising. Maybe we've experienced that in our own life and it surprised us because we thought as soon as the Holy Spirit takes over our life, we have this sort of magical power and everything in life is going fantastically and we don't have any issues. But what we find is the empowering of the Holy Spirit often, I would say, maybe almost always, leads us first into the wilderness. And this is where many people actually with good intentions and fired up for the Lord, they begin to say, wait a second. I'll put off that ministry you're calling me to. I'll put off that person you want me to talk to. I'll put off serving in this way or this way because it's, it's getting real. It's getting biblical now. Like things are happening. I'm, I'm stepping into this realm where I'm spirit led and I thought I would be hanging off chandeliers but now I'm in the wilderness isn't that interesting that the primary work of the Holy Spirit is to take us out in the wilderness not take us up on the mountaintop this is what he did with Jesus and notice in verse 12, it says he, he drove him into the wilderness. So that, that suggests just like some pressure. He, he drove him out. So it's very normal when one surrenders their life to God and says, Lord, do whatever you want with me. And as God begins to move, it's very normal to be taken out in the wilderness and taken in places where we're sort of stripped of a lot of things that make us feel good about ourselves. So in the wilderness, it's a, it's a picture of things being taken away. It's not a picture of the land flowing with milk and honey. And you may recall in the Old Testament, the land flowing with milk and honey was preceded by the wilderness. And so the Spirit drove him in the wilderness. This is part of being a Christian. This is part of being spirit-led, is to be taken into places where all we have is the Lord to depend on. And that's what is noticed in verse 13. He says, and, and he was there in the wilderness for 40 days. 40 days, 40 is a number of judgment and testing in the Bible. It's very interesting. Noah's flood was 40 days. The Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. But he was there in the wilderness for 40 days. And it says, tempted by Satan. So this is very specific about what was going on. So 40 days, and when you read Matthew's account, it seems like Satan only showed up at the end of 40 days with that particular testing. But here what we're seeing is that, that Satan, during the whole 40 days, 
was doing something in particular, and it says, tempted him. Satan was tempting him. And that word for tempt means to put through a trial to demonstrate one's character. So that's why we are taken to the wilderness. That's why Jesus was taken to the wilderness. This is a necessary step in our life as we serve the King of Kings is that he takes us to a place where Satan, and remember, God doesn't tempt, Satan does, but God allows Satan to tempt us or test us, and God has a reason for that. It's to bring about the quality of purity in our devotion and in our faith to God. That's the purpose of it. So, in other words, when things go well, materially, when we have success, oftentimes it's not a real test of our character, and most importantly, not a real test of our faith in God. So, what God does is He allows us to go through these fiery trials. Peter said, don't think it's strange when you do. And the purpose is to bring about a pure faith. What's a pure faith? A pure faith is a faith that depends on God 100% and doesn't need a bunch of things to prop itself up. And we live in a culture, a Christian culture, where many things are put in place to prop up false or fake faith while God is looking to move people out in the desert so that their faith would be real and only in God and God alone. And so as Jesus is brought into the wilderness, he's there for 40 days and he wasn't eating or drinking. And at the end of the 40 days, he gets into this specific testing that we're told about in Matthew chapter 3, where he was to turn the stones to bread. He was to throw himself off the pinnacle of the temple. And then he was to bow down and worship Satan. And with each of those, Satan was saying, you do this, I'll give you this. And what the temptation really was, and this is important, this will be very helpful for us. What the temptation really was, was to tempt Jesus to act independently from God the Father. Act on his own. Make his own decisions. Do what he, and, and he always gave some sort of shortcut, some sort of easier way. Some sort, he was tempting them in ways where he said, you don't have to do what God the Father called you to do. The same as the original temptation in the garden. Same stuff. But there's a lesson here. For effective ministry... It's so important, not only that our obedience brings about this power, and as God begins to work in our life, that we understand we're going to be put in positions of testing. Recognize this or these, these things. Recognize it as testing, not as, I got the short end of the stick. Not as I got, a, I got robbed, I got a bad deal. Don't look at it like that. Look at this as, this is God taking me into the wilderness to test me. And what is He testing? Our faith. And that's why when we're in these wilderness times, what's most important is that we exercise our faith to God. And in order to do that, we have to fully trust in the goodness of God. Be confident in that. Lord, you're good. I don't understand what's going on. I don't like, you don't have to like the wilderness. I don't like it. This is difficult, but you know what? Thank you. I'm going to have faith in you because you are good. And see, when you do that, you'll start to grow in your faith by leaps and bounds. But the opposite is true, that if we get into these wilderness areas and we are always trying to find a human solution or make ourselves feel better, some sort of out on our own, instead of submitting to it, we won't grow. We won't develop and we won't be effective in our calling that God has called us in Jesus Christ. 
And so in verse 13, the second part, it says, Jesus was also with wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him there. So, first point in effective ministry is obedience. It brings about the power of God. The second is the strengthening through the temptations of God, the testing of God. And then the third is simply the message of Jesus. So here we see Jesus, his ministry beginning. We see him baptized. We see the Holy Spirit come on him. And then we see the testing of him. And then it says in verse 14, it says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So that was his whole thing. So the, the third point is the message of Jesus was simple and clear. And so this is an area we also see being attacked in our day and age where you have to spice up the message. You have to make the message more relative as if there's something more relative than the message of the eternal God who will endure forever. The word of God endures forever. There's a temptation to be all gimmicky and to use sales techniques to get people to come. And all of these things cloud the simple message of Jesus Christ. And that's why the simple message of Jesus Christ is attacked so much. Because there's an, a, a thinking that it's not enough. It's not enough. The gospel's not enough. So you have to be an expert in sociology to be able to reach people. So there's all these books about social concerns and you read them and you'll be more confused after you read them. And the Bible says... Make disciples and teach them to obey the word of God. You don't have to be a PhD in sociology or psychology. Just teach them the word. Why is that a thing that is becoming such a problem in our society? And if you think about the decline of Christianity in America, it can't be understated. And the reason is because Christianity has moved away from the message. The simple, clear preaching of the gospel. That's, that's what we do. That's our lane. That's what makes us lights of the world and salt of the world. It's the message of Jesus Christ. Now, remember, you and I are message bearers and this message that we have is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it's truth that's unleashed upon the world. So maybe that's why there's a movement away from the simple, clear gospel. is because a lot of people don't like that. It's hard to fill pews and pay rent if you're going to stick to that message. So maybe there's an idea of running a church like a business and the church needs to make money and it needs to pay staff and it needs to have a building and needs to have... So, so maybe it's like, well, if we just preach the simple gospel, people don't want to hear that. It's not attractional. And so there's all these conferences that you can go to as a pastor to teach you how to meet the felt needs of the people. Teach you to grill a market like Grant Cardone and grill a marketing people into the church. This is some, a word called pragmatism where it says the end justifies the means. And that's not biblical at all. You're getting thousands of people to show up because you're compromising the message and you're tickling people's ears is not what the church should be doing. 
The church should not be at home in the world. And the church should not be a place where somebody that has been born again and saved out of the world should come and experience the world again. Do you want to come to church and experience the nightclub scene that you have been rescued from and saved from? You want the glory of God in the church. You want the goodness of God, the love of God, the power of God. You don't want all that, but that's what the world will say. But I'd rather take what God says and preach the gospel and stay focused on that because I believe the gospel is enough. So let's get a little bit more into that. Verse 15. He says the time is fulfilled. What he is saying, he's not talking about chronologically, like on a clock. He's talking about the era. The era of the Messiah is here, is what he's saying. Galatians 4.4 4 puts it like this. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. So when the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So that's Jesus. He's the kingdom of God. It's here. So here's what you need to do. And here's the message. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's the simple message of Jesus. So that was Jesus' preaching. His preaching was kind of like John's preaching, wasn't it? Repent. Why, why does he say repent? And why is that a, a thing? It's because we're all going the wrong direction. And in order to be right with God, we need to go a different direction. We need to, to stop. We need to recognize that our ways are not God's ways and vice versa. We need to recognize that we are dead in the trespasses of our sins. And so this is another area that's being attacked where the church is now redefining sin, leaving people in a condition that's unrepentable. Do we realize that? If the Bible is clear about a sin, and then we say, well, that's not a sin anymore. It used to be in the Bible, but now God didn't foresee this happening, and we're way more sinful now, so now you don't now it's not a sin. Know what you've done? You've condemned a person to hell because they are still dead in their trespasses of sins. And that's why Jesus said, You need to repent. Because the way you're going is not well, you need to turn to me. And when we tell, when the church, and this is what's happening in the church, when the church says these sins that the Bible says are sins are not sins and you don't need to repent, you're condemning them to eternity in hell. That's not loving. And so the, the church has a simple message, repent. And you know what happens also when we don't tell people to repent? They carry guilt around. Repentance is how God wants to free us from guilt. And when guilt is built up and we say, well, that's not a sin and just carry on. God loves you anyway. And God's saying, repent, I want to free you from guilt. I want to wash you clean. I want to take that burden off of you. It's interesting, a good friend of mine is a neurologist. And he told me that it's crazy he sees a, a lot of people going through transition therapy and things like that in order the LGBT thing and all that and he says every single one of them is on psychotropic drugs every, he said there's not one and so this is how we cover up sin and the problem in many of those cases you're just loaded down with guilt and God wants to free you from that guilt. He wants to free you from the weight of sin, but the church has become embarrassed to say that. The church has become afraid to say that. And that's not loving. That's selfish. That's being more worried about what people think about you or how people will receive you or how that may affect your relationship. And that's not loving. So Jesus' message was repent 
and believe the gospel. And so what we can take from that is that being ambassadors means that there comes a point where it's not just being a nice person, that you actually have to explain a person that Jesus loves them so much that they, they need to turn their life to Jesus and be forgiven of their sins. That we actually have to communicate that to them simply and clearly. And let's finish the last point. We have communion this morning too. So, verse 16, and the last point, See how fast Mark moves? And this happened, and this happened, and this happened. This. And he walked by the Sea of Galilee. And he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants showing that they, their family had a boat business, a fishing business. This is a big thing. And it says, and they went after what? What does that say? They went after him. And so the, the last point that we see is that to be effective in ministry, we have to answer the call of Jesus. And what does that actually mean? So that's what's important. What it means is that we actually follow him. Him, the person, Jesus. We follow him. And what that means, in order to follow him, that means that we are no longer fishermen. We are fishers of men. So then the question is, how do we uh, look, see ourselves? How do I view myself? Do I see myself as an accountant or a doctor or a mortgage guy or a veterinarian or whatever your job is? Or do you see that as something you do, but not who you are? See, whatever we do is not the gospel. What we are is the gospel that has affected us. And so everything that we do now is done in the name of the Lord. So whatever our station of life, that's our ministry. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, that's our ministry. So you may go to lunch today. And as you go to lunch, you start talking about, man, I don't know what my ministry is and I don't know what to do. Right now is your ministry. Right? When you eat that burger, eat it to the Lord. <laughs> And pray and be an example and be a model. When the Holy Spirit was to come on the early church, they were to wait, and it says, you will be witnesses. It didn't say go and witness to everybody, which, of course, you know, telling people about Jesus is part of it. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon a person, you are a witness. Have you ever been at a restaurant and it just blessed your heart to look over and see somebody eating a double-double but pray first? <laughs> that blesses me. That's encouraging to me. But here's the thing. We must see ourselves as fishers of men, not fishermen. We're not here to be fishermen. We're here to be fishers of men. And we have to make that our priority. And so whatever we're doing, we do it as unto the Lord and we see ourselves as as ambassadors of Jesus Christ in this world. And this is the most exciting life you can possibly live. The most meaningful life, the most purpose-driven life is to live your life for Jesus Christ as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. It reminds me of Jim Elliott, the now deceased missionary to the Alka Indians. He said, one life soon to pass only what is done for Christ will last. Amen. 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 Let's pray. We're going to have communion. 
Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you've entrusted the gospel to us. That in itself is a pretty remarkable thing when we think about it. I'm glad you entrusted it to us, but have given us the power of the Holy Spirit to complete it. And so, Lord, what a perfect opportunity that we have to take communion this morning and remind ourselves how good the gospel is, how much you have done for us.